Good morning and welcome to today's discussion hosted by the Global Center on Cooperative Security and the Program on Extremism at George Washington University about priorities for the Biden-Harris administration around preventing and countering violent extremism. My name is Melissa Leffis and I'm the Chief of Strategy at the Global Center, an independent non-governmental organization that works to advance inclusive human rights-based policies, partnerships and practices to address the root causes of violent extremism through programs with government and community stakeholders across the globe. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. The threat of far right violent extremism and domestic political violence is escalating, particularly in North America and Western Europe. Here in the US, white supremacists were responsible for two thirds of terrorist plots and attacks last year. Last week's disgraceful attack on the Capitol underscores the urgency and challenges of improved interventions to prevent and counter violent extremism domestically. We know from our work at the Global Center that effective CVE programming requires highly contextualized solutions that build on real trust between communities and government, including law enforcement. Domestically, however, we've seen community engagement undermined by racialized policing, denigrations of communities of color, and the stigmatization of immigrants and religious minorities. The incoming Biden administration, it seems clear, will also lack legitimacy in the eyes of large segments of the US population, even as threat from right-wing violent extremism continues to grow and be exploited for political purposes. In this polarized political environment, how can the federal government mount a credible and effective response to preventing and countering violent extremism domestically? Internationally, while we see declining deaths from terrorism overall, the threat of ISIL continues to metastasize and remains potent in the Sahel, South Asia, and elsewhere. The rise in right-wing extremism and the evidence of linkages between right-wing extremism threats previously considered purely domestic is of increasing international concern. Terrorist and violent extremist groups are leveraging the global pandemic to spread disinformation and increase polarization while states are normalizing emergency measures and heavy handed authoritarian responses. However, with the exception of more recent initiatives like the Christchurch call, we have seen little global investment in addressing right wing extremism, especially not at the scale and intensity with which the international community focused on is Islamist terrorism. In light of these challenges, how can the incoming administration rebalance international PCVE efforts to focus on addressing the drivers of violent extremism and ensuring respect for human rights? Before introducing our terrific panel of speakers, a few quick housekeeping, housekeeping matters. This session is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube and a link will be shared following the event. And we look forward to a lively Q&A session to ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will leave time for our speakers to address questions at the end, and we encourage you to send them in throughout the discussion. Our excellent panel of experts will help illuminate the current PCVE landscape, including the complex interplay between international and domestic policy responses to violent extremism. Speakers will share their insights into effective conflict prevention approaches from the Global Fragility Act to programming at the municipal level in New York City, and what key opportunities they see for the Biden administration to counter and prevent violent extremism. We will open the conversation by focusing first on the domestic context, hearing from Mary McCord, Legal Director at the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection and visiting professor of law at, George, at Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, followed by Seamus Hughes, Deputy Director of the Program on Extremism at George Washington University, and then Claire Abrams, Program Director of Deep Citizens Crime Commission of New York City. To talk about the U.S.'s externally facing international PCVE efforts and how principled U.S. leadership can help support efforts to address the drivers of violent extremism and ensure respect for human rights abroad, we will hear from Eric Rosan, President of PVE Solutions and Senior Associate Fellow of the, Rus of the Royal United Services Institute, and Richmond Blake, Director of Policy and Advocacy at Mercy Corps. 
Without any further ado, I will turn the floor to our first speaker, Mary McCord, who in addition to serving as the legal director of ICAP and a visiting professor at Georgetown Law Center, is also a distinguished member of the Global Center's Board of Advisors and a fellow with the Program on Extremism at GW. Previously, Mary was the Acting Assistant Attorney General for National Security at the U.S. Department of Justice from 2016 to 2017 and Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division from 2014 to 2016. Prior to that, she was an Assistant U.S. Attorney for nearly 20 years at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and thank you to the Global Center and the GW Program on Extremism for putting together today's program. Um, you know, I don't think we can really start out without acknowledging what happened in our country last week. Uh, if you didn't already recognize that we have a problem with political violence and extremism in America, last week's insurrection um, showed us that in living color. And that's hanging over the new administration as Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and all of their uh, appointees come into office. Clearly, it must be a high priority. But it also presents the same sort of challenges that we've seen um, in the past in countering other forms of extremism. How do you balance holding those who are responsible accountable while also trying to bridge that polarization gap that we have. I mean, we've seen it. I saw it, uh, I, I moved over to the Maine Department of Justice as um, Principal Deputy AAG of National Security in May, 2014, just one month before the caliphate was declared. The operational pace we had at the Department of Justice in the ensuing couple of years was as high as it had ever been since immediately post 9-11. And constantly we were struggling with that sort of hard force, decapitating, isolating leadership in order to try to squelch some of the extremist violence, but also trying to address how do we prevent people from being vulnerable to that extremist message and being vulnerable to radicalization, to violence. This is not a new problem. So there's much that we, the new administration can learn from the approach to terrorism in the past, but as I've just indicated, I'm not sure the previous administrations were really all that good at that. The harder part has been this part we're here to talk about today, which is how do you counter the extremism that leads to the radicalization to violence in the first place? And um, that's what this has been, just as we saw it with ISIS, people who are vulnerable to extremism, they might start out with a gap in their lives. They feel a need to blame someone or something for their grievances. Recently here and elsewhere, the prevailing extremist ideology is, has been to put that blame on, frankly, those who are not white. Um, the refrain, immigrants are taking our jobs, immigrants are a drain on our taxpayer money, immigrants are criminals. And worse in America is that, that view, that ideology, not only um, have so many people been able to find others who share that ideology online and go down the rabbit holes of just listening to themselves speak and agitate each other online, but they've actually heard it from the president of the United States and other elected officials, justifying and giving credibility to their grievances justifying and giving credibility to even the violent actions that they, that they plan and plot and including the violent actions of last week. One of the things that I think was so dangerous about what happened last week is that at that rally, just like the rallies in Washington in December and in November, the tent was very big. What I mean by that is those rallies brought together are the most far-right extremists. We're talking conspiracy theories that have not only been peddling false information about the election, but also you know, the same QAnon and other conspiracy theorists who peddle false information about child pedophilia rings. Most recently I saw even accusing uh, Chief Justice John Roberts of being part of a child pedophilia ring. Bringing together those extreme conspiracy theorists with 
armed, unlawful militias, far-right militias, who have been training and planning for some sort of actual civil war or violent overtaking in order to um, ensure that President Trump remains in office. These people at the extreme end were at the same rallies as people that, who I think reasonably, not reasonably, honestly believed there may have been some election fraud that cost President Trump the election. People who would consider themselves not to be extremists, but who have been vulnerable to the constant drumbeat, incessant lies coming from the president, his surrogates, and even media companies such as uh, One America News and Fox and others. So you have all of these people at the same place in Washington, at the same rallies. And the result is a recipe really for sort of that mass radicalization of those who came to really exercise First Amendment rights end up in a crowd, which becomes a mob, which overruns the Capitol Police, which in, uh, violently uh, invades the Capitol building, destroys property, um, steals property, and frankly, was intent on getting their hands on leaders in, in Congress and including Vice President Mike Pence. Um, I doubt very much that everyone who went to that rally last week intended to overrun the Capitol. But when you get that type of group together with those on who are espousing violence, encouraging violence, and, and taking the first act toward it, they bring along a lot others, a lot of others with them. So obviously this must be a priority for the new administration and it must include dedicated resources with direct access to the president. Now that's been said before. We've seen task forces before. We saw in the last administration setting up a joint DOJ, DHS headed uh, task force to try to address violent extremism. And I would say in large part, it was a fail. Um, We've also seen summits before, bringing together tech sector, civil society, government leaders, international leaders, and those have been good conversations. But I'm not sure what they've what they've led to, uh, other than you know a recognition of the problem. Nevertheless, I still think that you have to start with that. You have to start with bringing together all of the affected constituents. Um, so we're talking about government, we're talking about some type of task force, I think, and it's got to be probably in the White House. We can't have turf battles between DOJ, DHS, the intelligence community, the Department of State, you know, squabbling for who's uh, most important, who's going to lead a task force. It probably needs to be in the White House. And really, I'd say other than its place in the White House, it probably needs to be um, uh, focused more on outside of the government. Yes, you need some counterterrorism officials, former counterterrorism officials that understand terrorism, but you need civil society, including religious leaders from all faiths, community activists, the type of people who, who are listened to in their communities, the type of people who led the racial justice protests this summer, the type of people like Stacey Abrams, who was incredibly successful at getting out the vote with her organization Fair Fight in Georgia and elsewhere. You need, obviously, the tech sector, um, whose role in uh, radicalization to violence, not only Islamist extremist violence, but um, white supremacist violence and other types of political violence cannot be minimized uh, without the ubiquity and ease of access to social media. These movements would not grow as fast and as deep and become as dangerous as they have been. You need former extremists. Those who've been, and we're talking about those who uh, are former ISIS, those who are former white supremacists, form us to talk about that experience, to understand better what that radicalization to violence needs. We need conservatives, we need liberals, we need media experts, legal experts, communications experts to all really sit down seriously and come up with a, ma a mandate to come up with a proposals. And those must include a number of things as well. 
They must include review of our federal laws to determine whether there are gaps. Are there gaps in our criminal law, in their gaps in our civil law that must be addressed? This has got to include a review of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. I know that's been said many, many times, and it seems like it's a poison pill that many, many legislators are scared of, but it, it is something that has got to be addressed. They must provide funding and resources to communities at the ground level because any kind of program that is pushed down from the federal government down is just not going to be successful. That's been tried before and it's failed. But perhaps most important, and this is really the thought I wanna, I wanna leave people with as we, as we move on this morning and hopefully hear from people with more, even more concrete proposals, is we have to start thinking about extremism without regard to uh, ideology. To, for too long, extremism has meant in America, terrorism has meant Islamist extremist terrorism. We now know that our problem in the U.S., and we've known this for some time, is not, is not solely with, or even at this point, primarily with Islamist extremist terrorism. It's with white supremacist terrorism. Now, the director of the FBI has recognized this in his recent testimony, acknowledging that racially motivated violence is the greatest threat to the homeland right now, the greatest terrorist threat, and that within that category, white supremacist violence is the greatest threat. We've seen it with similar statements from the Department of Homeland Security, and we just see it with our own eyes in the terrorist attacks that occurred and the violent mobs that have occurred and the assaults on state houses that have occurred this year and the assaults on, on, uh, on other people who are not white. But we have to recognize that, you know, we have to re recognize the moral equivalency of extremist violence, regardless of the ideology motivating it, if violence is not an acceptable means to an end. And our approaches have to recognize that. And part of that also means recognizing the inherent biases that so many people in America have. If we look at the assault on the Capitol last week, and we look at how it was policed, soft policing. Now, I don't want to write now, soft policing in the face of a mob. And lots of people have been talking about why that is. There was such disparity between the policing at the White House, at the Capitol, and the policing this summer at racial justice protests. And before we say, let's throw out soft policing, I think we should all be encouraging soft policing at demonstrations so as not to roll back the progress made this summer. But we also have to recognize that when a mob is no longer engaging in First Amendment protected activities, they're now engaging in violence, you've got to be ready for hard policing. And that didn't happen at the Capitol last week. And you have to ask some questions why. Where did those inherent biases about a group of white people lead police to be unprepared and allow a violent overthrow of the building, at least for several hours, and a delay of the counting of the Electoral College votes? Those inherent biases, that, that starting place must be addressed. And we have to understand that extremism can look very much like uh, a large portion of this population. Thanks again for having me, and I look forward to more of the conversation. Thank you so much, Mary. And I think our next speaker, Seamus Hughes, will really pick up that um, notion of moving out of the federal government into the state and community level and what, who really needs to be at the table to take these uh, this agenda forward. Um, Mary, knowing that you won't be able to join us for the Q&A session, we're grateful for the time you've taken to be with us. Uh, before you go quickly, the people who illegally entered the Capitol last week, rioters, insurrectionists, seditious conspirators, violent extremism, extremists, domestic terrorists? So um, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, I think yes in the sense that what they were trying to do was use violence to intimidate and coerce and to affect the policy of government through intimidation or coercion. So that meets a definition of domestic terrorism. And there were crimes of violence that took place. I think though, it also very much is, meets, the, meets the definition of insurrection and seditious conspiracy. So that intent was to prevent the, the uh, domestic law from being enforced. And we're not even just talking about criminal law. We're actually also talking about the Electoral Count Act. I mean, the joint session was there that day in order to carry out 
federal law and count the votes. And they tried to prevent that. So I think that, um, that their intent was a terrorist intent. They committed insurrection. They committed seditious conspiracy. But happily, um, there were not the same level of sort of terrorist violence that we often see in a terrorist attack. Now, there was a Capitol Police officer killed through the violence, no question about it, and others were killed, but we didn't have a mass shooting. We didn't have bombs go off, although there were bombs planned. So right now, there wouldn't be, other, other than perhaps a weapon of mass destruction crime, there wouldn't be a terrorism crime that would apply to what happened, but there are ample crimes that do, I think, directly address what happened at the Capitol. Thanks very much, Mary. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker, Seamus Hughes, who is the direct, Deputy Director of the Program on Extremism at George Washington University. He previously worked at the National Counterterrorism Center and the US Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. He has, been authored numerous, he has authored numerous publications on terrorism, homegrown violent extremism, and countering violent extremism, including his recent book, Homegrown, ISIS in America, released in November 2020. Seamus, what insights and lessons learned can we glean from past CVE program experiences here in the US? Are those programs fit for purpose for today's realities? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. And I hate following Mary, but I will try my best. Um, before I start, I think it's important to note if anyone's interested in what happened last uh, week in terms of um, criminal records on extremism.gwu.edu, we have a database that we've been updating in live um, in real time about all of the individuals who've been arrested related to the Capitol Hill siege. Um, so I would encourage our, our viewers to go to that website, dive into the documents, it's kind of right in our wheelhouse of what we do in terms of tracking things. Um, the short answer is, is no. Um, the current counter violent extremism efforts um, will not address um, the issues what we saw last week, and I'll explain a little bit why. Um, but the story of domestic violent extremism, um, counter violent extremism in America is a story of fits and starts. Um, and I thought I'd give a little bit of an overview of what happened in the last 10 years on CV, uh, and then a few recommendations on what we should do in the future. Um, and then hopefully Claire will solve this all um, right after me. So. This is what we saw last week is what happens when you let things build, right? Uh, and so the Bush administration um, started, dipped their toe in the water of counter violent extremism with their ideas and actions section of the National Counterterrorism Strategy. The idea we should, we should counter the ideology of, um, at the time, Al Qaeda. But counter violent extremism as a concept really came to fruition during the Obama administration. In August of 2011, they announced a new strategy empowering local partners to prevent violent extremism. Uh, it identified four leads, DHS, FBI, DOJ, and the National Counterterrorism Center, what they called a group of four. Um, but the strategy said that, that the primary focus would be Al Qaeda, its affiliates, and its adherents with a general focus on violent extremism. But the vast, vast majority was looking at, at jihadism uh, in America. Now the strategy had three pillars, right? The first one was one, let's get better information to state and local cops so they can understand the threat. We had seen bad bulletins and intel to state and locals and they weren't realizing what they should focus on. And so building up our expertise on that. The second part, which I think is most relevant to the conversation was this, the strategy called for um, engaging with community partners targeted by violent extremists. Now in practice, that largely meant looking at and engaging with Muslim American communities around the country. And the fourth pillar was countering violent extremism, counting the ideology, so pushing back on the narrative. Right? Here's the problem. The strategy came out, there was a big press release, there's a good rollout at, at NPR, everyone's talking about how great the strategy is, but the, the, the short answer is, you know, there was no money behind it. Uh, it was a strategy with no, ex no additional funding. In fact, the strategy says explicitly, you shall use existing funding to do so, right? Um, I've never known a strategy that had any chance of success if you go that way. Um, and so after a few months, uh, you had a number of engagements using pre-existing um, programs. So what I used to run at the National Counterterrorism Center, or at least I was part of, was community engagement things. So when a bomb goes off in Boston, an imam in the mosque will call me and say, you know, Seamus, two guys just did a horrible thing. Can you help me talk to my congregation about preventing the next two guys from doing that, right? And those are tough but important conversations to have. Um, 
and, and you can figure out ways that the government and, and communities can partner together. But when the strategy came out in August 2011, it was followed up by a strategic implementation plan with you know, goals and objectives and leads, um, but again, no new funding. So after a few uh, years of kind of me and four of my friends trying our best to, to implement this, uh, the Obama administration with the rise of ISIS decided to uh, announce a White House summit, bring everybody together, what Mary talked about, bring everyone together and let's figure this out. And they focused it on three different cities, LA, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Boston. So LA was focusing on counter messaging, working with, with Hollywood and Silicon Valley on, on counter messaging and a little bit of off ramps. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul was focused much more on kind of root causes, what they saw as root causes. So how do we build resiliency against this idea of recruitment, similar to what we saw in the early European models for counter violent extremism. And then Boston, I think, had the most interesting model, um, although didn't get far along on it, which was um, doing one-on-one -on -one interventions with individuals that they were concerned about, who were part of, um, who were drawn to the ideology. So that, that happened. Um, but the problem is counter violent extremism, depending on the day, um, can be the cause of or solution to all the world's problems, right? Um, it is a hard term to define. And as such, it, get, it without it being defined by the US government, it gets defined by others. And so there was a building of um, advocacy groups, civil rights and civil liberties groups saying, this is not the government's role to do this. Um, they shouldn't be policing thoughts. So on the left, you had said, you know, don't police thoughts. And on the right, you had folks saying, you know, this is way too soft. These guys are terrorists. You don't want to hug a terrorist. Um, this should just be hard CT. And so there's no advocates in the middle advocating for uh, a, a non-law enforcement mean to stop uh, radicalization and recruitment in America. And we saw a very successful campaign by advocacy groups to try to limit and, and um, stem um, some of the counter violence groups and programs around the country. Again, with very little backing by the White House to try to push back on that. Then the Trump administration comes in and there was a concern, understandably so, given the, the campaign rhetoric about a focus on um, what they termed as counter Islamic extremism. Um, but once they got over there, they realized they kicked the tires and realized they actually liked pretty much the Obama approach. And so um, instead of countering by extremism, they did a, a branding change to terrorism prevention. So looking at folks that have crossed almost crossed the legal threshold and want to address it. Um, now that was that largely continued on for quite a while. Um, but here's a couple of things to think about, right? First of all, the the Trump administration then released their own strategy, looking at terrorism prevention, but also targeted violence. So things like um, the El Paso Walmart shooting would fall into the, the bucket. So counter violent extremism, if, if it was very broad before, is super broad now, right? And trying to define what programs look like for that um, gets very complicated very quickly. And I think Mary touched on it a little bit, but I want to highlight one other thing, which is um, the mixing of ideologies, right? Uh, meaning that if you're looking at far right extremists or domestic terrorists, um, they don't fall in the buckets that you want them to fall into if you're trying to build a program. So. Um, it'd be great if they were all white supremacists because then you could focus your counter and violent extremism programs on, all, on white supremacy and the ideology there. But the problem is they're white supremacists. They're also incels. They're sometimes boogaloo. They're sometimes other, uh, other things, accelerists. So it mixes together in a, in a cocktail that doesn't really um, help out the U.S. government to try to bifurcate and, and focus on the threat in any meaningful way. So they've been kind of trumming along for a little bit. The federal government has... has um, you know, largely pulled back their role on terrorism prevention. There's still a lot of good folks that are working on this in government, but it's largely been moved to the state and local um, um, jurisdictions. And I think Claire will touch on that a little bit. Finally, I just talk about a few more things, which is um, where's the Biden administration going on this? Uh, and the short answer is, I don't know. Um, but I'll tell you what I think is going to happen. So during the campaign, um, the Biden administration, the um, uh, president, Biden announced that he was going to um, stop the terrorism prevention office, um, pull back counter violent extremism programs, um, kind of a, a, a peace offering to the advocacy groups that had always complained about the program. Uh, at the same time, they announced in the Wall Street Journal that they were going to have a head at the National Security Council looking at domestic terrorism and focusing on counter violent extremism, right? 
So those two uh, comments at the same time make no sense, right? One says, let's eliminate everything. The other one says, we're definitely gonna ramp up countervailing extremism uh, on these issues. It's one thing to campaign, it's another thing to govern. And I think the Biden administration is going to learn that very, I think they already know that answer, but they're gonna learn it even more so in the coming weeks. Um, it'll be interesting to see if there's a ramp up of countervailing extremism programs uh, as it relates to domestic terrorism. The issue with ramping up on domestic terrorism for countervailing extremism is that the programs that the Obama, Trump, and Bush administration have been using domestically do not fit very well in addressing this threat now, right? You're not gonna run a round table with 20 sovereign citizens as a US government official telling them they shouldn't be sovereign citizens, right? Whereas the Obama administration used to do these kind of engagement with Muslim American communities about preventing um, ISIS from recruiting uh, young men and women from the group. So the tool set, the, the, the broad-based community engagement type of tool sets don't necessarily transfer to domestic terrorism. One would argue they didn't really transfer for ISIS either, uh, but it, it's going to be hard to transfer over on that. The other thing we need to wrap our, our heads around is, um, you know, again, Mary touched on a little bit, but you know, technology companies are still playing catch up. It's pretty easy to figure out what an ISIS flag is and take it down. Um, when you're talking about domestic terrorism or domestic extremism in general, there are quirky little things you need to understand about QAnon and things like that to be able to train your content moderators to know what to look for and what to remove. Um, and so there's going to be a learning curve that continues going up, um, caught into the middle of this question of Section 230, but also the fact that you know a lot of these things get quite close to mainstream politics too. And I'm not sure that that Twitter and Facebook and the rest of the groups have quite figured out how they want to address um, taking down content that gets quite close to elected officials. So there is there is that issue. Um, one thing I would, I would note is, you know, if you look at the numbers, um, they're clearly rising. And if anyone had tracked, you know, which we have, domestic extremism in America, you weren't particularly surprised by last week. You were saddened by it, but you weren't surprised by it. Uh, and so what it, what it tells you is the numbers are rising to the point where you actually can arrest your way out of this problem. Um, especially when you don't have domestic terrorism statutes. So you're arresting a guy for trespassing on capital state grounds and, you know, two, three years, if you're lucky, um, do you put them in a system in the prisons where they're only hanging out with other domestic extremists? Do you separate them? Do you spread them out in the population? What do you do on the back end, right? Uh, and so we haven't figured that out in any meaningful way. And I think the Biden administration should spend some time um, thinking this through before there's a giant announcement of what they're going to do. Uh, because if they get it wrong in the front end, they're going to have the same problems the Obama administration had in terms of trying to define what they're looking for. And so with that, I will stop um, and maybe kick it over um, to Claire. Thanks so much, Seamus. You've touched on a lot of important points and uh, thinking about the long-term implications of the decisions that the Biden-Harris administration will uh, make in these early days and, and how that really affects um, the long-term success of these programs. Uh, now we're delighted to have Claire Abrams uh, join us. She's the program director for the Deep Early Intervention and Terrorism Prevention Program out of the Citizens Crime Commission, where she works closely with, the, with government and non-governmental partners. Previously, she was the program director for Deep with the Eastern District of New York. Claire has widely presented on terrorism prevention and early intervention, including at the Global Counterterrorism Forum, Harvard Law School, the Brookings Institute, and the National Counterterrorism Center. Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning um, on what's, I would argue, a really important topic. Um, so, as Melissa said, my name is Claire Abrahams. I'm the program director for DEEP. Um, um, DEEP is run out of the Citizens Crime Commission of New York City and the CCC is a non-government, non-profit organization. We are tasked with finding innovative solutions for the most vexatious areas of crime and violence, most recently working in the terrorism prevention space with the DEEP program. Um, for context, DEEP, which is um, an early intervention program, came about basically because of the rise of ISIS in 2015. The government and specifically the DOJ 
were seeing a lot of cases pertaining to terrorism, but they were more non-traditional cases. So they were seeing a lot of juveniles, individuals um, maybe with uh, mental health issues and various other factors at play. Um, what they were seeing is cases and individuals who were not truly ideologically committed to ISIS or whatever the ideology that they were going down the path of may be, um, but did require some form of intervention, um, did require to get some help. Um, otherwise, there was a worry that these were the kinds of individuals that years down the line would be those people engaging in violence, terrorism, violent extremism. Um, so the DOJ um, basically realized that there needed to be more tools in the toolbox um, rather than just uh, material support for terrorism charge or doing nothing. So um, the CCC was tasked with developing um, the deep intervention. We, as I said, we're a non-government organization, so it's a, an entirely separate program, entirely separate entity. Um, we spent about a year plus um, really understanding the behaviors of this population. And by this population, I mean individuals who pose a low to moderate risk for engaging in terrorism or violent extremism. Um, individuals who are kind of dabbling with the ideology, um, dabbling with, the, with violent ideations, but have not yet crossed the threshold for being a serious risk of engaging in violence. Um, so we spent about a year understanding the behaviors, understanding the population, seeing what works to um, demobilize um, individuals in this, in this mindset. Um, I will say we are a program that works with demobilization, not de-radicalization. Everyone is entitled to their own views in America, um, so long as those views do not justify the use of violence. And that is what our program works to do, demobilize um, violence and violent ideations. Um, so, so when an individual is referred to us, we have a variety of risk and threat assessments. Um, a, to determine that individuals are in fact a low to moderate risk and not a high risk for engaging in violence. Um, be to understand really what's going on with this specific individual. What are the risk factors? What are their needs? What are the behavioral drivers behind these violent ideations? So um, we then work with an individual based off these risks to develop an individualized service plan. Um, that might touch on a variety of issues depending on what the individual needs. Um, social skills, critical thinking skills, um, whatever trauma the individual may have or may be experiencing, whatever therapeutic intervention an individual may need, um, family issues, social issues, uh, if there's mental health issues, depression, anxiety, whatever it may be, um, we develop a, a highly individualized service plan to address and mitigate um, those risk factors. Um, we work with the individual for however long it, uh, they need, it's approximately a year. Um, and throughout the course of the intervention, we have periodic risk and threat assessments to determine that the individual's risk for engaging in violence is in fact decreasing um, and they are progressing. Um, why, why is this all important? in the context of this panel. So we have had a variety of cases um, of individuals who have been um, on the domestic terrorism side and the violent white supremacy side. Uh, that being said, we are an ideologically agnostic program. So we will work with individuals across a variety of ideologies. Um, as I said, we, we work to address the underlying behaviors and the underlying drivers. So to a certain degree, the ideology is irrelevant. Um, it's more the behaviors that are the driving that individual um, down this path. Um, we have had cases, as I said, um, pertaining to domestic terrorism and the violent white supremacy ideations. Um, in these cases, it was very apparent that these were individuals who were not ideologically committed and in, in many cases didn't even really understand the ideology. It was these other extenuating extra factors that were driving the behavior. Um, 
for obvious reasons, I can't really go into the cases in detail, but I can say um, one of the cases was um, somebody, an individual who actually switched across ideologies. So they started uh, being a supporter of ISIS and then they switched to being a supporter of violent white supremacy. Um, so there was a lot of factors at play with that individual. It, it wasn't really about the ideology, it was about what was going on in their personal life. Um, there was another case whereby it was an individual who they themselves were not white um, and were following a neo-Nazi um, ideology. Um, I think right now with the um, circumstances that are surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing a lot of risk factors um, appearing that are especially relevant to these kinds of individuals who um, are early on in the stage going down the path of mobilization. So um, we're seeing people increasingly isolated. Um, that's one of the risk factors. We're seeing people spending a lot of time alone online, often, often in these echo chambers. On top of that is the fact that we're seeing a large amount of disinformation being put out there. So we have individuals online, isolated, echo chambers, seeing a lot of this disinformation. And on top of that, a lot of this population, we see um, lacks some kind of critical thinking skills or rather thinks in this black and white kind of way, whereby there's uh, not so much room for gray area nuanced thinking. So when they're, when they're receiving the dis this disinformation, um, they are taking it as is rather than, you know, in some cases, um, deciphering how accurate or, or how uh, believable this information is. Um, one of the things that we work on in the deep intervention is actually building up those critical thinking skills um, and broadening an individual's thinking through um, Socratic questioning and, and other techniques. Um, we also have a lot of um, grievances right now um, real and perceived. We have people dealing with stresses of the COVID-19 crisis. We have obviously a very um, divided country right now. And we also have individuals spending a lot of time at home for people whose, whose risk factors are about family trauma, personal trauma, trauma at the home. We have all of these factors that play together right now, um, creating basically you know, a perfect storm for individuals who may be going down this path of mobilization. Um, so I would say now, now more than ever, and as much as in 2015 with the rise of ISIS, it's really, really important that programs like this exist to work with these individuals to address these um, factors so that, you know, the, I would argue that many of the individuals who stormed the capital were not, as Mary said, were not intending to, you know, violently storm the capital, or there were individuals there who, who are not necessarily wanting to be violent individuals and are going down a pathway. And some of those individuals, I would argue, if they are intervened with early enough and get the help um, they need, um, would be, would be um, suitable candidates for this kind of intervention um, and will not hopefully be the kind of individuals in five years time down the line we're seeing on the news um, for engaging in violent extremism, terrorism, or, or whatever it else may be. Um, I'm looking at my time when I'm very aware of the time, so I'll stop there and um, thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, uh, especially for underscoring at the granular level what uh, the importance of early intervention and terrorism prevention, and particularly for flagging sort of the dynamic nature of um, individuals' connection to different violent extremist groups. I just want to note that we see the many questions that are coming in and we're taking note of them all. Um, please do continue to send them in and we'll do our best to uh, pull some together and address as many as we can during the Q&A session. Uh, we'll now turn our attention to the International Forum, uh, looking at what does PCVE programming look for the US's foreign policy. Um, and we ask, how can principled US leadership at the UN, the GCTF, and other multilateral bodies helpfully support rebalancing of international PCVE efforts 
to focus on the root causes of violent extremism and ensuring protection of human rights. How can the Global Fragility Act be leveraged to strengthen US government aid and programs? To address these questions and more, we'll start with Eric Roseanne. Um, Eric has spent nearly two decades working on international CT issues, both in and outside of the US government. During his six year stint as a senior CT official at the State Department during the Obama administration, he spearheaded the development of the GCTF, GSERF, and other international CT and PCVE platforms and was the policy coordinator for the White House CVE Summit. He has published widely on a range of international CT and CVE topics. Eric, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, thank you, Melissa, um, for organizing this. And um, I think as we're as we're thinking about the international um, side of the CVE equation, I think it's important to start with um, and what and what a new administration should do. I think it's important to start with looking at what we've learned over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, in terms of dealing with the threat overseas uh, that is obviously much more geographically diffuse and locally entrenched than ever before. Uh, we've learned that terrorism is really a political phenomenon and it's more than a military or ideological threat. And thus, all the military law enforcement intelligent tools alone won't be sufficient to deal with the threat over the long term. We've also learned that you can't succeed without addressing the conditions that terrorists exploit to recruit and radicalize, um, many of which were exacerbated during the pandemic. Uh, we've also learned that military operations and security assistance have all too often exacerbated these conditions. Um, and that many of these conditions also drive other forms of violence, conflict, and political instability. And thus a more integrated approach to preventing violence and conflict, including uh, violent extremism, as well as addressing fragility are needed. And finally, and I think perhaps most relevant to the conversation going forward is we, we've learned uh, about the importance of local context, local actors and local solutions when looking at how to mitigate the threat. So based on what we've learned, uh, I think the need for a rebalanced approach that relies more on cost effective, long lasting and non kinetic policies and programs that prevent terrorism and promote communities that are resilient to extremist violence are needed. Um, and this is based on a recognition that enha these enhanced investments in diplomatic and development tools in particular that prevent terrorism and violent extremism will lower the likelihood of future forever wars and reduce the cost of fighting terrorist threats. And this rebalanced approach will allow the new administration to focus more resources and attention on other global and domestic priorities, uh, uh, including climate, including cyber, including obviously the, the, the situation domestically in terms of uh, violent extremism. Um, so what, what should be the uh, key elements of a rebalanced approach that elevates international PCV uh, in, in, that, um, in that context? And I'll, I'll, I'll tick off five, maybe six if I have time uh, um, uh, of those elements. Um, and the first is the need to expand and strengthen the policy and programming toolkit uh, for dealing with violent extremism. On the programmatic side, this means more evidence-based, locally-led, long-term and tailored programs, particularly focused on secondary and tertiary uh, prevention. So dealing with individual interventions, either those who have uh, are on the path to becoming violent extremists or those that have already uh, crossed the threshold. This means supporting and engaging and empowering civil society and local actors and drawing upon public health and peace building prevention approaches uh, in this process. But more fundamentally, I think uh, the expanding and strengthening of the toolkit needs to focus on the policy side um, of, of international CVE, uh, which has largely been ignored over the last few years, uh, in part because it's very difficult. And in part, it's difficult because it really looks at how governments treat their citizens. Uh, and it's this a government citizen relationship uh, that is really and, and strengthening that relationship that is fundamentally at the heart of reducing extremist violence in specific contexts. But the new administration needs to do this, obviously, with a sense of deep, deep humility, particularly given the events of last week, particularly given the events of the last few years in this country, uh, and that um, demonstrating to the world that the US, as it engages on these issues, is as much in a listening mode as the learning mode. Uh, sorry, as much as a listening and learning mode as it is in the uh, sort of informing or teaching mode. 
Uh, and I think that's an important uh, uh, element here. Um, the second element of, of a, a enhanced international CVE effort, I think should focus on uh, wherever possible, integrating it into broader conflict and violence uh, prevention approaches. I know that Richmond is gonna talk a bit more about this going forward, but I think we shouldn't uh, discount the fact that this new Global Fragility Act has bi strong bipartisan support, including on the Republican side from Senator, Senator Graham, who really sees it as a new, more effective way for dealing with terrorism. And even though terrorism and counterterrorism don't feature prominently, if at all, in the act, I think uh, there are multiple ways in which to leverage the act to advance uh, counterterrorism and violent extremism uh, uh, agendas. Um, the next element is, I think, the need to uh, elevate human rights issues in bilateral and multilateral counterterrorism dialogues and not to consistently prioritize tactical counterterrorism cooperation with frontline states over addressing human rights abuses and political repression um, in those countries. Of course, counterterrorism cooperation on the security side will be essential for uh, successfully preventing and responding to threats to US national security, but they always have to be conducted in ways that are consistent with support for human rights, rights and democracy. And I think um, too often we've seen that bolstering unpopular, undemocratic governments militarily, as this current administration has too often done and will do until the very last day, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, it can unintentionally or perhaps intentionally make violent extremism more attractive to excluded populations that are forced to choose sides. And a key piece of this elevation of human rights in, in CT dialogues um, has to be uh, emphasizing the importance of protecting civil society space. Um, uh, uh, we know that civil society are, actors are critical for uh, not only preventing um, violent extremism at the ground, but also building resilience in communities. And if they're not allowed to play a, a robust role in, in the solution set, then I think um, we'll still be, uh, um, uh, you know, struggling to get ahead of the threat. Um, the, the, the next element I think that deserves attention is the resource piece uh, and to allow for more investments in in the very kinds of programs that we're all familiar with in the, in the international CV space that address the causes and not just the manifestations of violent extremism. Um, to show um, the current situation is, is how stark it is, and this is not just under this administration, it's for the past uh, at least 10, 15 years, the Counterterrorism Bureau of the State Department's budget um, is weighted so heavily towards law enforcement and border security programs. In fact, 95% of the budget um, goes to those kinds of uh, important, but still only a piece of the solution set. Only 5% is left for community-led prevention, intervention, resilience building efforts. Obviously, this, there needs to be some rebalancing here, um, uh, and that uh, should be a priority for the new administration, uh, I would argue. Um, and I think it would also, uh, deeper inv more investments from the US side will uh, catalyze further investments from international uh, partners. Um, the, Fifth piece is uh, leadership and organizational structures need to be in place in the US government, State Department, White House, et cetera, to ensure that not only is international CV elevated as a priority within the US government consistently, but with, within partner governments um, in, their, in their thinking about uh, uh, counterterrorism. At the State Department, I would argue that a much more integrated approach to addressing extremists and other forms of violence and conflict is, is really needed. Alignment of policy and programming in this uh, approaches in this area across multiple budget lines, across multiple offices uh, um, is, is critical um, going forward. And I think this will project an, uh, an important coordinated approach to partners as well. And then finally, and this gets at uh, uh, Melissa's question about the multilateral space, it goes without saying that um, renewed, sustained multilateral leadership from the U.S. Uh, will be needed here. Uh, it's in 2021. It's a very different world than 2016. Obviously, uh, the in, at the U.N. in particular, we've seen the rise of of the influence of authoritarian regimes, um, including in the counterterrorism uh, space. Um, there's a growing divide within the U.N. members on the most effective strategy for preventing terrorism. Uh, with a number of authoritarian regimes still favoring uh, uh, re more repressive approaches, uh, human rights issues, 
civil society space um, and the focus on prevention is getting um, less and less attention. And obviously the U.S. has been rather silent over the last four years uh, up, up at the U.N. on this, not exerting any kind of diplomatic uh, influence. And this needs, needs to change uh, uh, almost immediately. Um, and I think there's a great opportunity in the coming year for this, or in this year for this to happen when the U.N. global counterterrorism strategy is reviewed uh, in the summer. And um, I think the new administration has a, a, a wonderful chance to uh, demonstrate what kind of leadership it will uh, and what kind of vision it has for addressing terrorism threats and how starkly it differs from the current administration. But beyond the UN, and just to tick off a few things, um, I think at the Global Counterterrorism Forum, a great opportunity to elevate the fight against white, global white supremacist violence um, as, as a priority uh, around the 10th anniversary of the Global Counterterrorism Forum next year. Um, and the DISIS coalition, uh, I think, is a great opportunity to elevate prevention and addressing uh, the uh, structural drivers of violent extremism uh, in, in the ret uh, return, rehabilitation, repatriation of, of those in, still in Iraq and Syria uh, as, a, as much more of a priority. Um, and I think, uh, again, this should all be part of a larger effort uh, to demonstrate to, to, to the world that the U.S. is essentially back and is going to play a principal leadership role in the multilateral fora. Uh, challenges very quickly in this, in, in, in sort of activating this um, elevated approach, elevated priority of uh, international CVE. Um, one is convincing the American public that enhanced investments in all of these tools as part of a rebalanced counterterrorism strategy will reduce threats, will make it less likely to put troops in harm's way, and are most, more cost effective than the, the approach that has dominated the past two decades. The second is ensuring that any progress on this new approach doesn't get derailed should there be a major overseas attack. And there's a risk that that could happen. And it's here it's the importance of emphasizing that CVE is a complement and will never replace in the military intelligence law enforcement tools that will remain critical. Um, and finally, and it goes without saying that being able to lead by example and be an honest partner in a field where President Trump's actions and policies at home have undermined the United States' credibility abroad is going to be a huge obstacle. Um, and I think the new administration will need to prioritize reforming how extremist violence is addressed at home, including how the federal government engages and works with affected communities and demonstrating a willingness to listen and learn from its international partners that needs to be a core piece of this if it hopes to restore the credibility and return to a global leadership role that I would argue it had um, um, four years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. I think that last point you raised is, is critical and really demonstrates the interplay between the domestic and the international policies that the US um, Biden and the Biden-Harris administration will have to take forward. Um, to round us out, we have our final speaker, Richmond Blake. Richmond is Director of Policy and Advocacy at Mercy Corps. In partnership with the Alliance for Peacebuilding, Richmond leads the Global Fragility Act Coalition comprised of 65 organizations. Richmond previously served as a Foreign Service Officer and Policy Advisor to the Undersecretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy and Human Rights and is the recipient of the State Department's Human Rights and Democracy Achievement Award. Richmond, the floor is yours. Good morning and thank you to the Global Center and to the Program on Extremism for organizing this discussion. I'm very happy to be here representing Mercy Corps, a global humanitarian and peace building organization operating in 40 countries around the world. At this time last year, one in every 45 people globally were in need of humanitarian assistance and protection. Today, one in every 33 people need aid to survive. This alarming backslide over the past year means that assisting communities in need also means advocating for policy solutions to address the causes and conditions that are driving this human suffering, including by preventing and countering violent extremism. So this morning, I would like to share a few observations from our country programs before offering a set of recommendations for the Biden administration, particularly how it can leverage the statutory authority 
provided by the Global Fragility Act to advance a comprehensive PCBE policy. So what are our country programs observing in fragile and conflicted affected states, particularly as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, beyond the devastating health effects, Mercy Corps' initial analysis of the pandemic shows that some of the most severe and long-lasting secondary effects will worsen global hunger, poverty, gender inequality, and violence. We recently re released a policy brief, Advancing Peace in a Changed World, which is available on the research page of our website. This brief outlines how COVID-19 and government responses to it are fraying social cohesion, deteriorating state society relations, proliferating misinformation, providing opportunities for armed groups to expand their influence, and increasing resource competition. And research from past pandemics makes clear that exposure to infectious disease increases the risk of armed conflict. For example, in the case of Ebola in West Africa, Areas hit by the virus observed an increase in civil violence starting six, and nine months, six to nine months after the outbreak, and the effect persisted, lasting up to three years after the epidemic ended. Our country programs are already observing how armed groups, including violent extremist organizations, are capitalizing on heightened grievances, lackluster government responses, and weakened state institutions to gain sympathizers and supporters. For example, in one country program has observed a violence, the violent extremist organization set up a COVID-19 treatment center, seeking to demonstrate its commitment to citizen welfare in contrast to the government. And we've noticed in many of our country programs that violent extremist organizations have stepped up their online activity, celebrating the impact of the pandemic on the West and propaganda videos. And we're working now to adapt our programming to reduce the extent to which these groups can capitalize on frustrations with government's handlings of the pandemic. But more action and more support is needed to meet this challenge. I'd also like to provide some recommendations to the Biden administration about the Global Fragility Act. For more than three years, Mercy Corps has led in partnership with the Alliance for Peacebuilding, a coalition of 65 humanitarian, development, peacebuilding, and faith organizations in developing and advocating for enactment of this law. And our coalition is committed to working with the Biden administration to ensure its successful implementation. So what is the Global Fragility Act? Well, it was passed with broad bipartisan support in December of 2019 and it aims to better align efforts across the US government to prevent violence, violent conflict and extremism in fragile states. The congressional intent behind the law is clear. In the statement of purpose, it charges the executive branch with developing a global fragility strategy to quote, strengthen the capacity of the United States to be an effective leader of international efforts to prevent extremism and violent conflict. It specifically charges the US government with developing a strategy that is to pursue a multi-sectoral approach to reduce fragility, including efforts to strengthen state society relations, curb extremism, and make society less vulnerable to the spread of extremism and violence. Through a pilot approach, the Global Fragility Act calls on the executive branch to test this new approach in no fewer than five countries over the next decade and to report to Congress on its, pro on its progress on a biennial basis. Simply put, the Global Fragility Act offers the statutory authorization to leverage a whole of government approach to prevent violent conflict and extremism. And through the mandated reporting process, it increases public accountability to deliver. How can the Biden administration seize on the potential of this new law? I would like to outline a few recommendations. The first thing that the administration can do is review, revise, and reaffirm the US strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability, released on December 18th. This strategy, which is required, the foundational pillar of the Global Fragility Act, provides an important foundation and defines CVE as a core objective of the strategy. 
but it did not meet all of the statutory uh, requirements of the law. Most notably, it omitted the priority countries where, this, where the Global Fragility Act is to be implemented, um, as well as a list of agencies staffing and resourcing requests needed for effective implementation. The next administration can quickly build on this strategy and finalize the priority countries where the Global Fragility Act is to be implemented. Second, the administration should launch and seek contributions globally for the multi-donor Global Fragility Fund, leveraging the 25 million appropriated in the fiscal year 21 budget. This fund could be announced as part of the president-elect's summit for democracy that he's committed to hosting in his first year of office. The new administration can use this fund to raise contributions from government, private sector, and philanthropic partners and better align government diplomatic and development activities in fragile states. Third, the administration must elevate ownership of the Global Fragility Act to the White House to ensure that it is the whole of government approach that Congress called for in enacting the law. No one agency, office, or bureau has all of the authorities to deliver the multi-sectoral approach that Congress mandated in the Global Fragility Act. So implementation must be conducted through a collaborative process led by the White House. The, the first step the Biden administration can take is to rescind the September 4th executive order that delegated some authorities of the Global Fragility Act to the Secretary of State and instead return those authorities to the White House as Congress envisioned. It is critically important that agencies, CVE leads and policy officers participate in this interagency process. Fourth, the Biden administration can prioritize research and learning, and the US government should form a partnership with research entities to develop a comprehensive learning agenda for all GFA assistance and diplomatic uh, activities. And lastly, the Biden administration should seek the necessary resources to implement the Global Fragility Act in the president's first budget request. And passing the Global Fragility Act Congress authorized three accounts, and these should all be um, fully funded. As a point of comparison, throughout, throughout the past year, Congress passed five emergency COVID-19 relief bills, totaling ne nearly $4 trillion. Only a tiny fraction of that relief, less than one-fifth of 1% 1 was provided to global assistance activities, and the vast majority of that assistance was for vaccine distribution and medical relief. This means that a time we know that the secondary and tertiary effects of the global pandemic are worsening the drivers of conflict and violent extremism, U.S. assistance has simply not kept pace. Ensuring that the Global Fragility Act is adequately funded is an important step to begin assuring that we are responding comprehensively to this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richmond, and we really appreciate the very concrete recommendations that you've put forward for the consideration of the Biden-Harris administration and for our audience here today. Um, taking advantage of our last 20 minutes for questions and answers, and again, thanking everyone for submitting such great questions. You've made my task quite difficult. Um, so what I've tried to do is combine some questions so that we can uh, get to as many as possible. So first I'd like to address the first um, batch of questions to Seamus and Claire. Uh, thank you both for sharing some of the lessons from past administration's approach. As you point out, despite the comparisons between the narratives and exclusionary ideologies of ISIL and many far-right extremists, the tactics deployed against homegrown ISIL threat may be less relevant for countering the diverse forms of violent right-wing extremism we see on the rise. Maureen Farouk asks, DHS's prevention approach has been threat agnostic. Given the crossover of ideologies, would a broad community awareness training that focuses on risk factors, for example, being socially withdrawn, being increasingly combative about beliefs, harboring us versus them perspectives, um, would they still work? Or can the same prevention approaches still work, but just target a new population group? Or does the US government need a new approach to address domestic uh, violent extremism? And if so, what does that approach look like? And relatedly, Haruna Abdullahi asks in the chat, 
Are there international policies and practices or particular countries that the US could or should look to for inspiration in this regard? Perhaps I'll start with you, Claire. I was hoping you would start with Seamus, but it's okay. <laughs> um, I guess I'll, I'll address partially the first question um, and say, I do think having a public health approach as part of the overall approach is important. Um, and I do think, as, as we said, there are um, a variety of underlying factors which are relevant across ideologies um, and relevant risk factors um, for, for various different individuals and across ideologies. So um, as part of the broader CT, CVE, PVE, every acronym strategy um, that the government adopts, yes, I, I do think a public health approach should be part of that. Uh, Thanks so much, Seamus. Yeah, let me just, um, and the short answer is is no, I don't think the current approach is, is um, the right way to go when it comes to um, this type of threat. Um, I don't think it was the right approach to begin with. Um, and I think, you know, programs like what Claire is running now is is, is probably the best bet uh, for countering extremism. I'm, I'm not a huge believer in broad-based um, engagement when it comes to security um, authorities. So DHS, NCTC, FBI, um, mostly because that's not their their sweet spot, right? They're not going to run a don't do drugs campaign in any really effective way. What they can be effective with is I've got a thousand cases, 900 of them I'm going to run against a hard CT informants, things like that. And a hundred of them I'm a little concerned about and, but not enough to close the case. So what's the other options I have? Or conversely, I've got a 16 year old kid spouting his mouth off about how much he loves what's happened um, last week. How do I talk to that 16 year old so I don't have to open up a full field investigation against him and wait till he turns 18 and then charge him with you know, gun charges? That seems like a silly way to, to do things, right? And so what, what I would encourage the, the Biden administration to do is to get away from broad based engagement. Um, one, because you know I think it's hard to do. And, and two is you can't really measure effectiveness, right? You can't go back to Congress and say, you know, we hit up uh, 100 million people on our ad campaign and, you know, that stopped this number of people from being domestic terrorists. Like you just, you can't get the metrics on it. You can get the metrics on closing an, a full field investigation of the FBI um, through non-law enforcement mean. And, and that is, is tough. And the one thing I would note, and I think um, Claire would, would agree with me, but maybe she won't. Um, we need to set a standard of, um, of success when it comes to intervention or disengagement to not to be 100%. What you're looking for for intervention and disengagement is like a five to even 20% success rate. And that's a win, right? Um, you're trying to, to lower the amount of, of folks you got to put in the van running eight hour shifts for seven, seven weeks at a time. What you're trying to do is close a few cases with non-law enforcement means. The ones you can't, so be it, but at least you tried, right? Uh, and so we can't just say, because somebody got kicked to an intervention program and they ended up committing a violent act or getting arrested that it's a failure. In fact, I think we need to accept the fact that there is going to be um, a number of people that go through these programs who do not change their mind. And that's okay. You're looking for, again, that five to 20% range. And so we need to set the expectations. The problem is, I don't think we're very good at setting expectations. So um, if an individual goes through an intervention program uh, or a disengagement program and then commits an act of violence, I could see congressional hearings saying, what the hell happened? Why didn't you guys do surveillance? Why didn't you do X, Y, and Z? Um, but the truth is, you know, there's just not enough manpower out there to be able to do it. And so we have to accept a level of risk um, because I think it's the best way to, to respect our, our rights and civil liberties in, in the long run. Thank you, Seamus. And I think just sort of emphasizing that disengagement isn't a linear path. Um, that it is uh, more dynamic than that. I'll now turn uh, to Eric and Richmond for the next pair of questions. Um, and Eric, you, you touched on this, but I wanted to drill in a little bit further. Um, what role can multilateral institutions play in shining a light on the role that states play in driving violent extremism? There's obviously the state sponsor of terrorism issue and holding states accountable in that regard. But how can multilateral institutions contribute to holding states to account for abuses committed in the name of countering terrorism in reining in the worst impulses of governments? 
and less related, but I wanted to tag tag this one in as well, uh, coming from Thomas Crawl, uh, who submitted the following. The root causes of violent extremism differ domestically and in the West, comparing with the enablers of violent extremism in developing countries where we see weaker governance, socioeconomic factors, and climate-related risks. In your opinion, will the Biden-Harris administration change the approach to PCVE in comparison to previous administrations, specifically addressing the vulnerabilities related to climate change as it was highlighted as a priority of the Biden administration? I'll begin with Eric. Um, thank you. And I'll take the easier question first, except they're both very difficult questions, so it's not really a choice here, an option. Um, so the, the, on, on the latter question, I think obviously climate's going to be a huge priority for the new administration, as you can see by all the uh, announcements and appointment of John Kerry and everything. So I would imagine it's going to feature uh, in, in thinking and across a whole range of issues in ways that um, it hasn't before, uh, which I think is a positive thing. I, I, I can't predict how it's going to interplay with um, policy thinking around uh, dealing with violent extremism overseas. Uh, except that I just would predict that there'll be some um, more thought given to the interplay uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in that ar uh, arena. On the, on the, on the first uh, question, I think um, we shouldn't be uh, sort of naive to think that all of a sudden um, you have a new administration that is much more committed to um, promoting human rights and promoting democracy abroad and um, reigning in some of the excesses of the past uh, few few years, decades, in terms of uh, over-securitized approaches to countering terrorism and the behavior of uh, uh, governments, and to expect that to then all of a sudden lead to the UN and multilateral organizations taking a new, adopting a new, um, uh, tougher stance against the repressive uh, actors. I think, um, uh, it's going to be a very sl a slow, steady uh, slog to try to get um, uh, more attention to these issues in uh, counterterrorism for uh, around a multilateral for around the world that deal with counterterrorism. Um, I think um, uh, the unfortunate reality of the Security Council is China and Russia are permanent members, and they their views on the role of civil society and their views on um, the role that governments play as the you know, perhaps the exclusive actor in dealing with terrorism is is is, is not going to change. Um, I, I'm not sure how much energy one should waste in trying to change that dynamic in this in the uh, in the Security Council because of the obstacles to doing so, uh, and that rather to look for other fora where where one can make perhaps make a difference. And I would just like to throw in one possible uh, idea, and that is. Um, the multilateral system is all, as for the most part, is a, is a state-driven, government-driven system um, that has few opportunities for civil society and other local actors to uh, play any kind of uh, agenda-setting role, let alone um, even being given any voice. Um, I think there is an opportunity, perhaps, to consider the, the development of a platform that allows for it's a multi-stakeholder platform with governments, uh, civil society, um, private sector coming to the table to look at the integrated suite of issues around preventing conflict and violence and addressing fragility. Um, that will include dealing with violent extremism um, and that will allow for a new avenue for thinking about uh, how do we deal with these threats in a much more sophisticated, integrated way, more bottom up, uh, with an agenda that's set not only by governments, but in partnership with civil society and other non-government actors. And I get that China and Russia may not be at the table for that, but I think that would be a way to uh, generate much more momentum, much more energy and new ideas around dealing with these phenomena um, while continuing to sort of slog it out in the more traditional fora where I'm afraid that the Russia's, Russia's and the Chinese are, are gonna continue to be difficult to move uh, in a way that we'd want them to move. Well, multilateralism is at the heart of the Global Fragility Act in the statement of purpose from Congress. One of the uh, prior priority areas of, of focus is 
engaging in the multilateral space and better aligning U.S. Uh, diplomatic and programmatic activities with, uh, with partners. Um, the Global Fragility Act, interestingly as well, also touches on the second question related to environmental degradation. And uh, Congress, um, in passing the law, set out a list of uh, criteria that the executive branch is to use when selecting countries and communities where the initiative should be implemented. One of those factors is environmental degradation and specifically uh, calls on uh, the government to target those programs in places where um, resource competition and um, environmental degradation are driving conflict. So we very much expect that that will be part of Global Fragility Act implementation in the strategy that was released um, by the current administration last month. They recognized uh, that um, component of the law and has signaled that that would be taken into consideration in implementation of the act. So we very much do see uh, environmental stewardship as an important part of addressing fragility and threat in, um, abroad. Thank you both. Uh, so many good questions and eight minutes to go. So just as a quick follow-up for both Eric and Richmond here, um, we have a, a submitted by Adam Ravenkild of the MFA of Denmark. He writes, in the past, a number of international CT CVE initiatives have been designed to bridge gaps between the West and the Muslim world to address the threat of militant Islamism. Which parts of the existing global CT architecture is bet, best fit to promote and more, in, more international cooperation on addressing right-wing extremism? Perhaps I can start with you, Eric. Uh, sure. Um, I think it's interesting, uh, for starters, that um, for many years, the mantra has been everything the UN is doing, everything the, all these other multilateral organizations are doing on terrorism and violent extremism is about all forms of terrorism and all forms of violent extremism. So the fact that we're now asking ourselves, what can these new platforms do to deal with um, white supremacist violent extremism either suggests that that mantra didn't actually mean what it, what they said, what the, what the, what the government said it meant, which is um, it actually was focused more on Islamist violent extremism um, uh, than other forms. But it also begs the question is, what are the different tools? Are there, are, is a toolkit different for dealing with um, uh, right-wing ex extremist violence and Islamist extremist violence? And I think that is the first question that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think it is being addressed a little bit in different, in different fora, but I think um, fundamentally we have to be careful about um, slicing and dicing how these four deal with different, you know, the, the violent extremism uh, conundrum um, and um, singling out one or another form of violent extremism to suggest that whenever there is a, a threat that rises to the top of the, um, of, the, of the threat chain that we now have to then think about a whole new set of tool, uh, tools for dealing with that threat rather than thinking about what existing tools can be leveraged for that issue. That being said, I think the Global Counterterrorism Forum is best suited for a um, beginning to focus on all these issues because it can, it is flexible, it is more informal. The Russians and the Chinese are more, much more relaxed um, in that environment and will allow for much more innovation and creativity to flow. Um, and if there's some good ideas, some good initiatives, some good uh, toolkits that can be emerged emerge from that process, that it may then be able to resonate in a UN setting. Uh, we saw that when the GCTF started dealing with the foreign terrorist fighter phenomena, a lot of that um, work then uh, flowed into the Security Council and beyond. So I think that's the place to start. And that's why I think in September 2021, uh, when the GCTF celebrates its 10th anniversary, there really should be a eleva elevation of the importance of dealing with right-wing extremist violence in that fora and hopefully the new U.S. administration can sort of champion that, that kind of initiative. I would add, this is precisely why the Global Fertility Act Coalition has been so focused on a research and learning agenda and component as part of this law. And we understand that the current uh, 
monitoring and evaluation process for assistance programs is insufficient, that a more comprehensive research agenda with uh, multiple methods um, and sharing that information um, across uh, program activities and across donors will be critical to answering this question that you're asking. We need to stop uh, looking only at uh, individual programs and the outcomes of those individual programs, but also start aligning and arranging our, our research um, mechanisms in a way that really start answering the question of how do they add up? How, what is the cumulative effect of all of these programmatic and diplomatic efforts uh, to address violence prevention? Um, so uh, uh, research and learning must be uh, at the heart of GFA implementation and of a broader um, PVE policy in the US government if we ever hope to, to, to be able to answer that question satisfactorily. A final question before we get uh, concluding remarks from all of our speakers, and this one is for, for Claire and Seamus. Uh, speakers noted that the federal government will have to restore its credibility over time and that the Biden administration will likely direct more resources and responsibility to states, municipalities, and community-led efforts. What kind of coordination will be required across communities and states? Are there specific mechanisms or approaches that the federal government should implement to increase local and state ownership of PCVE interventions while ensuring cohesion across those decentralized efforts? Seamus, perhaps you can start. Sure. Um, so I think first and foremost, uh, I would see the federal government as playing essentially quality control um, for the state and locals. So setting baseline standards of what a program should have, what metrics should be involved in it, uh, but not necessarily pushing to say, this is what your program should be. At the bare minimum, your program should have these things, but you know, adapt as you, as you see fit. Um, you know, there is a dedicated team at DHS that is working on these issues um, and a number of individuals in the field, um, at least a dozen individuals in the field from the federal offices that are um, embedded in US attorney's offices and, and DHS field offices around the country. So I think we're going to see some serious movement in the state and local um, area. My, my question is going to be, um, you know, as the Biden administration decides to, to perhaps appoint a domestic terrorism coordinator at the National Security Council or another role like that. How does that person coordinate um, with the counter mounting extremism um, groups? Or are they, or he or she gonna focus entirely on the hard CT um, efforts? Yeah, I think I'll just add, um, and it's really kind of just reiterating what Seamus already said, um, but often um, the local programs which are running both within and outside of the US are running so effectively and actually having too much interference from above can sometimes work to undermine the effectiveness of those programs and the trust that's already been built between those programs and the communities. So I would say often it's, it's good to allow what's working locally to continue to work as is. Um, with what Seamus said about, you know, just quality control and things of that nature. Thank you all. Uh, uh, maybe 30 seconds for final remarks. We'll start with Richmond, Eric, Claire, and, and finish off with Seamus. Thank you. Well, COVID-19 has set off not only a global health crisis, but its secondary and tertiary effects are leaving millions of people vulnerable to violence and conflict. And to date, the US government has just not invested in comprehensive global assistance response, leaving many of these challenges to fester. The Global Fragility Act provides the Biden administration with the clear legal authority and policy framework to begin addressing the causes of conflict. But for this nascent initiative to be successful, it has to be a whole of government effort, including officials who work on PCBE policy. Um, thank, thank you. I would just say that um, despite the fact that there are all these other priorities that the new administration will understandably uh, be confronted with, I think uh, there are a number of low-hanging fruits in the uh, international PCVE um, space 
that uh, create opportunities early on in the administration for the uh, for the U.S. to signal um, a it's back at the table and it's back with a, sort of a, a, a progressive, forward-looking um, uh, vision that embraces prevention and embraces the role of local actors and embraces human rights as a core piece of uh, the solution here. Um, and it, while the resources may flow a little later, um, uh, I think, and the structures may flow a little later, I think rhetorically it's really important for the U.S. to, to uh, deliver this message uh, multiple fora, multiple times in the first 100 days, and there are numerous opportunities for doing that. Yeah, um, I suppose my, my final words would be, they're actually, again, echoing what Seamus was saying earlier, which is it's really important for people and groups and, and uh, non-government organizations and so forth to get involved in this space um, and to not be scared to do so for fear of things not working. Um, I think it's really important that we we try to um, invoke efforts, even if they don't work 100% of the time. It's obviously very important to do no harm. We don't want to do things that make things worse, um, but it's important that we do things, even if they don't work all the time. Um, so in some cases, lowering the barrier to entry for non-government organizations and local efforts to get involved um, is an important step in that. Um, that's all I have to say, and thank you so much for having me. Thanks. I guess my my wrap up is um, to say that for domestic countermeasure extremism, um, the next month, two, three months is the defining moment, right? The Biden administration has a window to decide whether they want to push their chips in and do countermeasure extremism programs both domestically and internationally. Um, I think they have a window, given the events in the last week, to do so, and I think um, can think it through. But my concern is if they decide to do so without putting together a structure and defining what they're looking at, they're going to be in the same situation and that the Obama administration was uh, when they announced the three cities, which is if you don't, are you if you aren't able to wrap your head around what you're about to do, uh, it's going to be defined by others outside. And so I think they have an opportunity to do some good work, um, but I, I'm mildly terrified that. Um, they'll get ahead of themselves a little bit with an announcement. So I, I hope that they think this through a little bit more. Uh, thank you, Seamus, for underscoring the urgency of uh, the, the Biden-Harris administration to get this right. Um, and consistent across all the recommendations made by our speakers is the need for highly contextualized and adaptive solutions that reflect the multitude of violent extremism forms at the international and domestic levels. I'd like to thank our speakers and the program on extremism at George Washington University for co-hosting today's event with the Global Center. And thank you, our audience, for joining us. Have a great day.